Okay, we welcome you to Calvary Bible Chapel on this beautiful Lord's Day morning. We pray God's richest blessing upon you as we sit under the ministry of His Word this morning. For the past seven weeks, we've looked at the prayers of the Prince of Peace from the cross. And this morning, we're going to look at the reaction or the product what happened after the cross? Uh, we have some good and we have some bad. So this morning, and uh, maybe I should just mention, I pretty much had the message all in order, ready to go. I was going to start just, you know, really flowing. This was Thursday morning and then the Lord said, no. So Thursday I changed the message, not that I, and I, I, I'm looking forward, very much looking forward to getting to the concept of ask, seek, and knock. And I, I really prepared a lot for that this week. And then Thursday I had to push it down my pages and, and start a new message. And so this is, this is the new message, the product of the prayers of the Prince of Peace. The product of the prayers of the Prince of Peace. We looked at the seven sayings or the seven prayers from the cross and um, they're still in your bulletin. We see the first one, then said Jesus, Father forgive them for they know not what they do. The second one, oh. The remembering Redeemer, Jesus said unto him, to the thief, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Woman, behold thy son, and son, behold thy mother. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Into, or oh, I thirst, I'm sorry, I forgot. I'm, it is finished, and into thy hands I commit my spirit. So we looked at those for the last seven weeks. Now, I would like to read each of the Gospels, starting in Matthew chapter 27. We're going to look at the product, the parable, and then the point. The product, the parable, and the point. I'm going to start at the end when Christ gives up the ghost and go to what we would say is the last of the reactions or the product. So we're going to start in verse 54, Matthew chapter 27. And I think, I think I've got these in order. All of the people and their reactions, I'm going to skip the... Uh, the veil rending and I'm also going to skip the uh, the people who came back from the grave and walked around in Jerusalem but uh, I, wa I want you to see here the reaction of the people who were there at the foot of the cross essentially so we're going to start Matthew chapter 27 in verse 54 now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. And many women were there, beholding afar off, which followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering unto him, among which was Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's children. And when evening was come, there was a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. And he went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock, and rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. And there Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulcher. The next day 
that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that the, de the deceiver said, while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead. So the last error, what an interesting phrase, so the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, Ye have a watch, go your way, make it as sure as ye can. So they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. So you have quite a large group of people here that we want to consider, and we won't be able to consider them uh, maybe in detail, each one of them. But you have different reactions, don't you, to the cross, to the prayers of the cross. Some of them were very personal, obviously, to the thief. Some of these, we would say, it is finished. Uh, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Even though they were uh, intended and, and pointed towards the Father, you would say that each person here must have at least be affected by these prayers. And that's the point I want to bring across this morning. I want you to consider these people, these, these different groups of people. Certainly the centurion, what an amazing blessing. Stephen uh, mentioned it again uh, as we were doing some work. And, and what a blessing it is to my heart to, to see this man, this Gentile man, look up and say, truly, this was the Son of God. I got goosebumps. I got goosebumps. Truly, this is the Son of God. What a blessing. And how those prayers affected the centurion. As Christ prayed, it is finished. And why hast thou forsaken me? Joseph of Arimathea. Um, the use of this man from God and uh, you know going in and begging the body and making sure it was taken care of and the women and again I think that they were uh, very concerned about how the body was going to be treated I'd never thought about the fact that it was Joseph who put the stone in front of the, the uh, tomb I, for some reason I guess I always thought it was you know the Romans or the Jews who did that but we also see the chief priests, the, Pharisee and, uh, the Pharisees and Pilate, all, you know, surmising that, oh, we have to. You know. Okay, so pretty interesting um, dynamic there, isn't it? All right, well, let's turn to Matthew, or excuse me, to Mark 15. And um, a pretty close reiteration, a little bit less. Mark chapter 15. And verse 37 is where we're going to start. Again, as Christ gives up the ghost. Mark 15, 37, And when Jesus cried with a loud voice, he gave up the ghost. The veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. And when the centurion which stood over against him saw that he so cried out, he gave up the ghost and said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. And there were also women looking, women looking afar off among whom was Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, the less of Joseph and Salome, who also when he was in Galilee followed him and ministered unto him, and many other women which came up with him unto Jerusalem. And now when it was evening was come, behold, because it was the preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God, came and went in boldly. I love that, don't you? I boldly. Those prayers that Christ prayed on the cross. See how they're affecting the centurion, the women. And now this dear man went in boldly unto Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. And Pilate marveled. If he were already dead, calling unto him the centurion and asked him whether he had been dead any while, had been any while dead, excuse me. And when they knew of it, the centurion, he gave the body of, to Joseph. And he brought fine linen and took him down and wrapped him in 
linen and laid him in the sepulcher which was hewed out of rock and rolled a stone unto the door of the sepulcher and Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph behold where he was laid um, I, I wish I would have taken time the significance of it you know a, a new tomb where no body had ever laid uh, you know I know that um, you've probably heard how important that was Christ being so pure but just so precious here but again um, pretty much the same group of people here affected or not affected by the prayers let's look at um, Luke 23 Let's see if I can get my screen to change here. Luke 23. And we're going to start in verse 45. I guess we can start in verse 46. Luke 23, 46. Uh, when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. And when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. And all the people that came together to the site, beholding the things which were done, smote their breasts and returned. Hey, there's a new group. And all his acquaintances and the women that followed him from Galilee stood afar off beholding these things and behold there was a man named Joseph a counselor and he was a good and just same had not consented to the council and deed of them important very important that there was not a unanimous decision and even though there wasn't a unanimous decision they again went ahead with um, the trials Annas and Caiaphas he was of Arimathea, city of the, of the Jews, who also waited for the kingdom of God. This man went unto Pilate and begged the body of Jesus and took it down and wrapped it in fine linen and laid it in a sepulcher that was hewn in stone, wherein never man before was laid. And that day was the preparation of the Sabbath drew on, and the woman also which came with him to Galilee followed after, beheld the sepulcher, and how his body was laid and they returned and prepared spices and ointments and rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment so we get a little bit more about what the ladies were doing they were anticipating trying to um, embalm the body very very precious uh, their desire here is uh, of utmost of course their intention I think uh, was misplaced but uh, we also have the public I, I kind of put that I think that's the way I put them there yeah the public these people who were there and smote their breasts um, and returned verse 48 I'd like for you to remember them and all that people which came together to the site beholding the things which are done smote their breasts and returned that's really all we know about them don't know who they are, don't really know much of anything else about them, but um, there they are, another group. And we get a little bit more um, about some. Well, let's turn now to John chapter 19. Let's read the last section. Those were the synoptics. And now John chapter 19. And we're going to start... In verse 30. John chapter 19 and verse 30. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation, bodies should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath day was a high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. In other words, they wouldn't be able to lift themselves up to take a breath so that they would die quicker. The hypocrisy here, huh, of the Jews. Then came the soldiers and break the leg of the first and of the other, which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus, saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. Obviously, scriptures would foretell that uh, he would not have any bones broken but the scriptures also say that he would have his um, side pierced right but one of the soldiers with the 
spear pierced his side and forthwith there came out blood and water. Just, uh, I probably should have asked Steve before I got up here, but uh, as far as I know, there's a compartment around your heart that's filled with liquid and it keeps the heart from drying up. And so can you imagine the thrust of that spear as it went into his side, that it would actually have to go up even to about right here. Now, why would the soldier do that? That was one of the questions I had for myself this week. I never, I guess I never really thought about why would he do that? And most commentators believe that he wanted to make sure that Jesus was dead. And a wound of that extent would most definitely make Jesus dead if he wasn't dead already. So this was a very, very deep wound. So much you may remember that Jesus said, you can thrust your hand into my side. So it would have at least be, the wound would have to be, the cavity would have had to have been at least the size of a man's hand. And to be that deep that it would go into, do you know the, yeah, that, what he said. <laughs> yeah, that had to have been pierced and then blood and water must have rushed out. But there's no doubt that uh, this convinced everybody that Jesus was dead. So you have this soldier, he's new to us, here in John chapter 19. Let's pick it up again in verse 35. And when he saw it bear record, and this record is true, he knoweth that he saith is true, that he might believe. Who, who saw it? Who is, who is verse 35 talking about? It's talking about John. The writer, he's saying, I, I who saw it bear record, and this record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true, that he ye might believe. John is giving his own personal account that not a bone was broken, his side was pierced according to the scriptures. Look at verse 40, uh, 36. For these things were done that the scriptures should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they, have, whom they pierced. Well, we're introduced again to Joseph of Arimathea in verse 38. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews. Oh, that gives us a little bit more. Now you may appreciate when it says in the other Gospels that he went in boldly. Do you think that the prayers on the cross had a good effect on Joseph of Arimathea? I think so. But secretly, for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. Oh, here's someone new, verse 39. And there came also Nicodemus. You remember Nicodemus from John chapter 3? Here he is again. You remember he came by night to see Jesus. And we're not sure if uh, he was just real busy during the day or if he was... Maybe a little tentative, not sure. But here's Nicodemus. What an effect the prayers on the cross must have had to Nicodemus. There came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh, aloes, about a hundred pounds weight. And they, and then, excuse me, then took they the body of Jesus. And wound it in linen clothes and the spices in a manner of the Jews to bury, to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified there was a garden. And the garden a new sepulcher wherein was never man yet laid. And they laid Jesus therefore because of the Jews preparation day. And the sepulcher was, uh, excuse me, yeah for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. So I... As I mentioned, I wanted to take this week, and this is a prayer, or this is a study on prayer. And, you know, some of the prayers were very personal to an individual, you know, like Mary or the thief on the cross. 
But there are other prayers that would be much wider. Uh, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I would think that it would pretty much apply to everyone that's been up on the screen here. Uh, it is finished, certainly. Would apply. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Would certainly, all of those would apply to each one of these. The product. So, as I started this uh, study this week, I, I got to thinking about the parable of the sower. And so I'd like to look at the parable of the sower. Okay? So let's turn to Matthew chapter 13. And as I started to think about the parable of the sower, I started to see the different types of ground. Matthew chapter 13. Did quite a bit of studying on this. Again, very refreshing, very interesting. Let's begin in verse 1 of Matthew chapter 13. The same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside. And great multitudes gathered together unto him. I want you to get the context. A lot of people there. A lot. Even so that uh, he went into a ship and sat down. The whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. Now, if I'm not mistaken, the first three or four parables, Jesus gives the explanation of the parable. But there came a point, and I'll point that out. Maybe I should do that now. Turn over to uh, verse 34. Uh, verse 34. Verse 34. Some of these parables, Jesus didn't explain out. Look at verse uh, 34. All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Look at, very, look at verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away. Is that the Jesus that we know? Jesus sending the multitude away? And went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying... Hey, we, we didn't get the parable. We didn't understand it. Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. And we won't take the time to read Jesus' explanation. It's not the uh, point this morning, essentially, to go through each one of these parables. But um, they asked for the interpretation and they got it. Did you catch that? They asked for the interpretation, and they got it. Not everyone got the interpretation. Only those who asked got the interpretation. Okay? Let's go back now, if you don't mind, to the beginning of the chapter. Pick it up in verse 3. Up to this point in Jesus' ministry, and if you were to look at where we are in the time frame, we're about a year and a half in. Up to this point, Jesus didn't use many parables. But to this large group of people, he speaks to them in parables. Now, I hope that you are asking in your heart, where is this going? Where is he going? We just looked at the prayers of the cross and now 
Pastor, this goofball up here is talking about parables. How, where are we going here? Will you give me a minute to make it? Okay, just, just cling on for just a few more minutes. Let's look at the parable. Verse 3, he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside. The fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where there had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But others fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. He that hath ears, let them hear. So he starts to speak in parables, and the disciples notice this, and they ask him in verse 10, The disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? I don't know that they're... Can you imagine them coming up to Jesus and saying, uh, I don't know that they're getting the, the point of these parables. And Jesus says, I know. I know. And he goes on to quote uh, from Isaiah... Uh, Verse 11, he answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but unto them it is not given. Can I stress that? Why wasn't it given unto the large group or crowd of people? For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more in abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seen, see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. Verse 15, the people's heart is wax gross, their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes, Satan has closed. It's not what it says. It says they have closed. Lest they at any time should with their eyes, see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and should understand their heart and should be converted and should be healed. Blessed are your eyes, verse 16, for they see your ears, for they hear. So Jesus gives the reason why. And you'll, you'll never be able to convince me that Jesus didn't want these people to understand what he was saying. Jesus wanted these people to understand, but he also knew that they did not want to truly understand what he was saying. They, they didn't want the spiritual deep meaning of these passages of Scripture, these great parables. Jesus realized that he was going to have to be rejected and go to a cross. The nation of Israel, for the most part, was rejecting him at this very moment. I'm not saying that individuals couldn't still come to him. But a nation as a whole was rejecting him. And so he actually started talking to them in parables. Why? Because they had plugged their ears, they had covered their eyes, and they had made their hearts hard. These Christ-rejecting Jews clearly showed that they were not with Christ and therefore they were against him. Their attitude of rejection is stated in the, Luke, in the Gospel of Luke, we will not have this man reign over us. As a result, the kingdom of God did not immediately appear. It was postponed and that's what was going on. And by the way, we live in the postponement. We're living in the postponement of the kingdom. 
From God's point of view, Israel rejected Christ, but this did not take him by surprise. Okay. Jesus would go on, and let's pick it up in verse 18. He says, Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. So if you'll look up on the screen here, I've taken the groups of people that I had up on the screen a minute ago, and I have now put them in categories. The wayside ground would represent the Gentiles, the soldier, Pilate, people who heard about Jesus but could care less. I, I even put the soldier, and the, the soldier I mean is the one who actually put the spear into his abdomen. I even put him in this category, the, the wayside ground. Those that were there, they saw, they may even have heard some of the prayers that Christ prayed that day. They heard, they understood it not. And so the wicked one, Satan, catches away that which was sown in his heart. So, as far as I know, Pilate, Herod, none of them ever got saved. They are the wayside ground. Secondly, in verse 20, but he that received the seed into a stony place, the same as he that heareth the word, and Anon with joy receiveth it, yet it hath no root in himself, but dureth for a while, and when tribulation or persecution ariseth, because of the word, by and by he is offended. And I put the public in this in, as this ground, the stony ground. Do you remember them? They were there. They saw what was happening. They may have even been um, emotionally moved. Do you remember what they did? They smote their breasts. But that was it. They just kind of went their way like, oh man, that was horrible, or oh wow. I mean, you know. This is the, the stony ground. They fall under that, at least for me this morning. They fall underneath the stony ground. They, they have some emotional response and we see many people who have emotional responses you know how many times I've asked a person if they're saved and they said well I made a deal with God one time that if they would get me out of if he would get me out of this situation and so in my mind I'm going ding ding I'm not sure I do try to take people at their profession much more than I used to Many people have emotional responses to situations and, and circumstances in their life, but there's no salvation. There's no change of mind about who God is. And I, I just wonder if those people that were there at the cross who, who watched this gory event smote their breasts. They were emotionally moved. How many churches do we have today that are trying to move people emotionally? You know, we're, we're in this time now where you have this praise and worship, so you have, you know, people who come up on stage and they sing the same uh, refrain over and over, and you're supposed to be standing. What, what are they doing? They're trying to get you so emotional. There's nothing wrong with emotions. God gave us those. But we can't allow them to get in a place of preeminence. The Word of God, submission to the Holy Spirit, that's where our preeminence wants to be. I'm, okay, i got to keep going. We also have now the thorny ground. Look at verse 22. 
he also that received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. So I put this as the Jews, the chief priests, the Pharisees, Annas, Caiaphas. Um, both Mark and Luke mentioned this as well, the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things entering in choke the world, uh, word, and it becometh unfruitful. That's Mark. Luke says, and that which fell among the thorns are they which, when they had heard, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. So we're going to call this the, the thorny ground. The, this is the Jews, the people who were really the ones who put Christ on the cross. And now, finally, finally we get to think about some good ground, huh? Look at verse 23. But he that receives seed into good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit, bringeth forth some, uh, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. Luke says, but that on good ground are they, which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, kept it, and bring forth, forth fruit with patience. With patience. Oh, how refreshing is it to think of the centurion. Truly, this man was the son of God. He was a righteous man. How refreshing is it to think of Joseph and, and Nicodemus. These men who may have been a little timid and the boldness of these men how refreshing is it to think of the women and even uh, John the beloved here people who were there at the cross and so beautiful so sweet okay pastor but um, how do these how does the, I, I guess I see it, Pastor. I, I see the, the people at the cross and the parable of the sower. I, you, you've made that clear. But this is a, this is a, a, a message on prayer. So what's your point? Well, thanks for asking. I appreciate you asking. Jesus prayed some of the most immense, I don't know, I'm, I'm a loss for words, prayers on the cross. My question is, how many of them do you think got answered? Did what God just, you know, when it comes to Pilate or Annas or Caiaphas or the soldiers or. I mean, it's, it's easy for us when we think how neat it was for the centurion and for Joseph and Nicodemus. I mean, it's, it's so refreshing to be able to think about this group of people when it comes to the cross and their reaction. Sorry. We're going to think about the others. Did Jesus' prayers not get answered? For the other groups? I believe they did. Now, they didn't get answered the way that I want them to get answered. And I can also believe very confidently that they didn't get answered necessarily the way that Jesus wanted them 
to be answered. Jesus wanted everyone to be saved. He was dying for them. So my question today is, sorry for this, I'm not really sorry, but my question today is, do all your prayers and desires get answered the way you want them to? The answer is no. From a, from a human perspective, not all of my prayers get answered the way that I want them to get answered. I also want you to see that when Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them, he was praying for Herod and Annas and the soldier and and those prayers were answered. They just weren't answered the way that I think they should be answered. And that's the point of this message this morning. Not all of Christ's prayers from the cross were answered the way that we think they should be answered. Does this mean that Jesus' prayers weren't heard? No. When your prayers aren't answered the way that you think they should be answered, do you think God didn't hear you? No. This is, does this mean that the Father and Jesus weren't on the same page? <laughs> Never. No. A thousand times no. God's will was accomplished perfectly on the cross that day. God's will and God was glorified in everything that happened that glorious, victorious, miraculous day. For those of you who haven't been in Sunday school for the past few weeks, we've been talking about the fact that our purpose is to glorify God above everything else. And I would like to finish with this very same thought this morning. Just because God's answer to our prayers isn't what we want doesn't mean that our prayers haven't been answered. And I wanted to give you Jesus as the primary example. Did Jesus want Annas to be forgiven for his sins? Caiaphas, Herod, all of those wicked men who, um, you know, even the people who smote their breasts and left, and many of them may have gotten saved later, I don't know, but... Every person at the cross... glorified God. So when God says no to our prayers or doesn't answer them the way that um, we want them to be answered, they were answered the way that he wanted them to be answered. Are we willing to submit to that? Jesus was. For at the end of the time on the cross, he didn't say, wait a minute, Lord, let me hang up here a little bit longer. There's some people here that still aren't convinced. I know the centurion isn't convinced. Uh, look at these dear women. They're convinced. I see John, my beloved John over there. Oh, I see, I see, there's Joseph of Arimathea. There's Nicodemus. But wait a minute, Lord. It's not what he said. He said, it is finished. Into thy hands I commit my spirit. And God's will was accomplished just as much to Annas and Caiaphas and Herod 
as it was the centurion and John and but we don't we don't like to think that way do we I mean we we'd love to think about the centurion and what a blessing he's been to my heart this week just to think about this Gentile man who would say truly this was the son of God but I don't like to think about Herod and, and all of the Jews that came together and suborned and, and tried to cover their sin and make sure that no one stole the body. I don't want to think about that as Jesus or God being successful. That's a problem with this and this. So I have there at the bottom here, God has, is, and will answer every one of your spirit-filled prayers for his glory and your good. Every one of those prayers on the cross were answered for God's glory and for our good. Even though some men never came to know Christ as their Savior. God's glory is the manifestation and demonstration of who God is. Some of this will be for a review for some of you who have been in Sunday school. The living God is made himself known. This is his great purpose and this is his great program. Even lost souls in the eternal lake of fire will bring glory to God, their creator. Not all will be saved, and we see that. And so I've taken this principle that we've been thinking about for the last few weeks. I've taken this principle and I've applied it to the cross and the prayers of Jesus on the cross. And I want you to see that not all of Jesus' prayers were answered the way that we wanted them to be answered. And so I can safely say that not all of your prayers are going to be answered the way that you want them to be answered. And that's okay. And it better be okay with us. We ought to be satisfied with his answer. Not all will be saved. Most will be eternally punished in hell. But God will be glorified. God's glory is the outward manifestation of who God is in his wonderful attributes and perfections. The glory of God is the governing principle and overall purpose of God's dealing with men in every age and that includes everyone that was at the cross. In every dispensation, God is manifesting himself to men and to angels so that all may redound the praise of his glory. Dispensationalism places the glory of God above everything else. Whereas there are those who tend to emphasize sortiology uh, the God's purpose in saving men above everything else. The salvation of souls is but one of the means by which God brings glory to himself. Just one. God is doing something very special in every and each dispensation. There is one thing that God is concerned about more than anything else, and it's not the salvation of souls, it's his glory. The glory of God is the outward expression of who God is. The glory of God is making known, uh, making known of God's wealth, worth, and weight. God is a great God, and throughout history he has been making himself known to men and to angels. The chief and ultimate purpose in creation and in all that God does is his glory. The manifestation and demonstration of who he is. Do we dare make anything else our chief priority? Do we dare make anything else our chief priority? But, Pastor, I wanted 
this person to do this. And your intention may be very, very good. But not all of your prayers are going to be answered the way that you want them to be. God's glory is the very reason we are here. We need to be more concerned about God's glory than we are about anything else. To fix our eyes upon anything else than the glory of God can result in disaster. For him, this is Romans 11:36. For of him, through him, and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. If we fail to understand this, then we are missing the most important piece of the puzzle. The entire puzzle of God's purpose and program fits together only when the pieces representing God's glory is placed in its rightful position and preeminence. To elevate anyone or anything else to the sacred place reserved only for God's glory is strictly forbidden by the Lord himself. My glory I will not give to another. His main reason for dying on the cross was to save souls? No. It was to glorify God. Did people get saved because he died on the cross? That's the only way to. Jesus in his prayer in John 17 says these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said Father the hour is come glorify thy son that thy son may also get a bunch of people saved. No he says that thy son may glorify thee. Every person at the foot of that cross glorified God. Some in a different way some in rejecting him. Some, so sweetly, and such an encouragement to us, believed or were emboldened. The Lord Jesus was more concerned about the glory of God than anything else. One of the chief reasons Christ died on the cross was for the salvation of the lost. But the main reason was to glorify his Father. Was it God's chief priority? What is God's chief priority? Is it the salvation of souls or the glory of God? A decision must be made and the decision will, turn, will determine one's theology. Would you turn with me in closing to Proverbs 16.4? I'll read this just very quickly and we'll end. I think this is from Charles Bridges. By the way, I think what I read, just read was from George Zeller. I want to give him credit for that. What a blessing that has been, our study in Sunday school. I wish there were more here to hear it. But that wasn't God's prayer to be answered this morning, was it? <laughs> Proverbs 16, 4, The Lord hath made all things for himself. The, the verse isn't done yet, is it? It says, Yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. This is from Charles Bridges. Even the wicked, whose existence might seem to scarcely reconcile the divine perfections, he includes in his grand purpose of setting out his name. It is the greatest praise of his wisdom that he can turn the evil men to his own glory. He made even the wicked for the day of evil. Wicked they are of themselves. He made them not so. He compels them not to be. He abhors their wickedness, but he foresaw their evil. He permitted it, and though he had no pleasure in their death, he was glorified in them in the day of evil. And when they sin by their own free will. He ordains, ordains them to punishment as the monuments of his power, his justice, and his long-suffering. Clearly, God is not the author of sin. He cannot impart what he has not, what is contrary to his nature. 
Infinite perfection cannot impart imperfection. Absolute holiness cannot be the cause of sin. He can decree nothing but good. If he permits evil, as so far as to not hinder it, he hates it as evil and permits it only for the greater good. The greatest of all good. The more full manifestation of his own glory in it and out of it. He will be glorified or on all of his, all his creatures. All thy works shall praise thee, O Lord. His retributive justice, no less than the riches of his grace, set out his glory. I'm going to say that one more time, last phrase. His retributive justice, no less than the riches of his grace, sets out his glory. You will not be able to convince me that Jesus was a failure at the cross. Every one of those prayers were answered. But I think my main thought this morning, beloved, was if Jesus' prayers didn't get answered at the cross the way that we think they should, what are we going to do the next time that one of our prayers doesn't get answered the way that we think we should have it answered? And I, I believe with all my heart that you, you have the utmost desire. You have the, the best well-being for your family member, for your loved one. But God doesn't answer that prayer that way. What are you going to do? You're going to think that God didn't hear you. You're going to think that God doesn't love you. You're going to think that, I don't know. Those would all be very unscriptural, wouldn't they? God hears your prayers. And is answering them. Isn't he? Even though they may not be answered. The way that we think they should be answered. Let's pray. Thank you Father for the product at the cross. Thank you Father that each one of these people. Those prayers from the Lord Jesus were answered. Some in a positive way. And some in a negative Forgive us, Father, for not thanking you enough for the positive answers to prayer. And forgive us, Father, for not thanking you for the negative way that sometimes these prayers are answered of ours. God says, no, I will not violate that person's free will. Forgive us for not glorifying you. When he says no or wait, it is for our greater good and most importantly for your glory. Forgive us for our frailty. Help us, Father, to align ourselves with this wonderful book. Through the enabling work of the Holy Spirit, we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen.